So hello and um, welcome to And Performance. This is an interview series made by Mount View exploring the MA Performance Programme. My name is Dr Joe Parslow and I'm an MA tutor here at Mount View. I work primarily on the MA Performance Acting and Musical Theatre strands um, and I'm also a researcher and I publish writing on queer performance and queer communities, as well as being a producer of drag performance and nightlife events in London. In these conversations, we're gonna to talk to graduates of the MA Performance Programme, and I'm gonna ask them questions about their experiences on the course and what they've done since graduating. On the MA Performance, alongside the programme leaders, Cheryl Gow and Merrin Owen, I'm really interested in how training in acting and musical theatre can be complemented by rigorous and critical engagements with theory. On the Creative Project Unit, which I work on in particular, students engage in a practice research project where they create specific presentations or performances which are grounded and led by research. So these can range from performance lectures and workshops all the way through to autobiographical performances and drag shows and sort of everything in between. And students gain an experience in making their own work as well as conduct um, academic research at master's level. Um, and today we're going to be talking about artistry, advocacy and performance. And we're joined by two graduates of the MA Performance, the Musical Theatre Strand, Beth Hinton-Lever and Miko Toivyainen. So, hello, hello, hello. Um, I am going to now do the slightly embarrassing thing of reading your biographies back at you. So feel free to uh, uh, do exactly this. Um, so we'll start with um, Beth. So, uh, Beth has a BA in Classical Archaeology and Classical Civilizations from University College London and an MA in Musical Theatre from Mount View. Uh, Beth's theatre in credits include, and there's going to be a list now, uh, Millennials as part of Empty Fest and the Turbine Theatre, Living Newspaper at the Royal Court, Dick Whittington at the National Theatre, Treasure Island at Derby Theatre, West Side Story at the Curve Leicester, As You Like It, National Theatre and Queen's Theatre Hornchurch, Hades Town at the National Theatre, Spring Awakening, at Hope Mill Theatre, Reasons to be Cheerful as part of Grey Eye Theatre Company and a UK tour, and Sleeping Beauty and Dance Hall as part of Cast Doncaster. Uh, film and TV credits include Men in Black, International and Silent Witness. Beth has also provided the voiceover for The Blind School, Pioneering People and Places for History of Place and Museum of Liverpool. Her awards include the National Student Drama Festival Award for Best Choreography, as well as being a 2021 Evening Standard Future Theatre sorry 2021 evening standard future theatre fund recipient to musical theatre and um, she's currently associate choreographer on the para orchestra's new project hi hello Beth. <laughs> now it's your turn Miko to sit and grin whilst I whilst I do that uh so let's get Miko's bio up so Miko has an MA in musical theatre from Mountview as well as an MA in acting from Helsinki Theatre Academy he was recently awarded Theatre Actor of the Year by the Finnish Actors Union and his autobiographical monologue won the title Monologue of the Year 2020 currently he's working in Finland as part of Improv Theatre Stella Polaris and was just added to the ensemble of KOM Theatre one of Finland's oldest theatre companies Theatre credits include, we've got a good list here as well, Cabaret at Turku City Theatre, Chris in XY, NAMT New York, and the rest of me floats with Outbox Theatre, Honeymoon in Vegas as Turku Open Air Theatre, Dance of the Vampires, Helsinki Theatre, Toxic Cabaret with Q Theatre, The World was made for us as part of the Finnish Comedy Theatre, The Sex Musical with Turk and Van Ayuko, Gas Inspector Palmu as part of Helsinki City Theatre, and Family of the Year at Theatre Tacoma. Television and credits include Goldfish, Fast Adult and Hotel Swan. And voice credits include Arlo in Arlo, The Alligator Boy, Frankini in Henry Danger, Ginger in The Queen's Corgi, Missabelle in Moomin Valley and several radio dramas for Finnish radio theatre. Miko is also working as a part-time teacher for Helsinki Theatre Academy and has done work as a consultant on trans representation. So you can see excellent candidates here to come and talk to us about advocacy and artistry and performance and it's really actually amazing I was thinking that uh, both of you were in the cohort of the first year that I was teaching at Mountview and it's really amazing just in reading that to see the kind of excellent and exciting and the breadth of the work that you've both engaged with um, since yeah since finishing so I'm gonna do much less talking now and pass it over to you I'm gonna ask you the kind of the first question 
um, which is really about the type of work you've done since graduating, and really, um, how do you decide on the type of work you want, type of work you want to go for, or the type of roles you want to audition for? Can we start? Shall I pick? Can we start with Beth and then move on? I knew you were going to go to me first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for having us both. Um, I'll speak on behalf of Miko. Um, it's it, it's so amazing to be here and be able to have this chat. And um, I'm so excited to be here. So I guess to jump straight in and answer your question, um, what is the type of work that excites me? I tend to look for something with quite a strong um, heart. And I will explain what I mean by that because I know that's so generic. But I, um, I love shows that kind of have a big ethos of community outreach and engagement. Um, I was lucky and I worked before I came to Mountview and both shows I did had community ensembles and um, it's really something that has stuck with me and something that I want to keep honing at and learning from because as much as uh, oh, I never got that when I grew up, I never got to be part of a professional show, but um, seeing kind of the community get to come in and how excited they are about being part of the show, but equally how much they teach me about why I do this job and how much you can actually learn and teach and glean from these people. Um, for example, I did, as you said, As You Like It, which was the um, National Public Acts um, show for 2019. And we had over a hundred community uh, participants and they were they all taught me something and you know it was one of the most magical things i've ever been part of i was playing jake so i was quite lucky that i got to step back a lot of the time and just got to watch this magic happen and getting to stand getting emotional already joe i told you this would happen <laughs> i got to stand and watch a hundred people singing and dancing because they wanted to and it was, you know, there wasn't the pressure that we put on ourselves. There wasn't, you know, this heightened level of, well, this has gone from my hobby to my job. So it, you know, my whole life depends on it now. It, it just reminded me that we do this because it feels good and it feels amazing to connect. And so that's something that I really try and find in jobs. So anything that has that sort of community engagement and again, what I mean by heart and kind of meaning and depth is anything that for me has authentic voices within it so a lot of the time if i'm being checked for a disabled character if that's had been written by a disabled writer i'm already on board because i know that i'm speaking truth um and i'm not showcasing a perception that might not be true of a community that i'm part of so again that's something that i really look for um and then finally i guess to say because i will be quiet in a minute um i look for what I could bring to that project. Um, so I guess how I personally would fit into it because every part I play is maybe 80% Beth, 20% <laughs> character. So it's how um, I would bring myself to it and what I think I could add to that project. Um, and I'm sure we'll go more into detail about specific examples of that. So I'm going to let Miko speak. <laughs> Oh, I just, I love this already. Uh, thank you, Joan. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so wise. I love this. Um, <laughs> it's tough because I can't just be like, yeah, yeah, what she said, except I'm not disabled. <laughs> but um, I have to, even though I'm here to talk about advocacy in the arts, I feel like I have to say that my reasons for doing theater are so selfish. <laughs> I just fucking love theater. Uh, that's why I got into it and that's why I keep loving it and keep going back to it. Um, I am at my happiest when I get to do theater and I feel like if I couldn't do it for a living, I would still find ways to keep it as a hobby. So <laughs> toss any work at me and I will probably be happy to do it. <laughs> Sorry to say, but um, I feel like I'm one of the few trans actors in the world who who haven't really 
gotten the chance to play trans characters despite being publicly out. I've mostly done, done cis roles. Um, so honestly, that's something that I sort of mm, aspire to go towards. I'd love to bring more trans characters into life. I'd love to uh, increase trans representation and make it better, uh, create positive representation, because I do feel that people with lived experience have that power within them. Um, but theater itself just holds such magical power, I think, I feel, I believe that it has the power to change the world and to change um, perception. And um, so I think that's that's something that I that I look for in, in every work opportunity. And this is going to sound so terrible, but <laughs> I think as actors, we do need to um, look at a script or look at a show and find what's the thing in this play that will make the world a better place. Because nobody, you know, we're not doing this to, to um, enhance stereotypes or, or um, work as a negative force in this world. So I feel like that's where we come to what Beth was talking about, bringing myself into the characters that I play. Every role is probably 80%. It's actor and 20% is the role, because <laughs> no matter what, um, me being trans will inform every role I do. It'll, um, it'll inform the character's thoughts. And because um, what I bring on the stage is my experiences, my emotions, my thoughts, my worldview, what I hold dear. So as long as it's something that has room for that, uh, I'm... 100% happy. Uh, the best are the shows that have a creative team who will allow uh, discussion and, and growth and, um, and people working together and being allowed to authentically be themselves and, and um, have the space to bring themselves into what we're doing. Did that make any sense? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Yes. We're muting each other to be kind, but if, if you could hear us, just I know that we're just screaming <laughs> while the other person's talking. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, thank you both. That's really, really interesting. And I think also, like, for me, the links between that idea of heart that you're talking about, Beth, that feels like as you're kind of trying to, it's like how we try to articulate these things which are so emotional or so embodied or so within us. I think heart is a really good way of describing that sense of like, of, of it being grounded, of, of being able to be in the work as, as yourself, as yourselves, being able to be present in the work as yourselves, bringing yourself to the stage in, in, a, in a kind of complex, meaningful, sticky, messy way and all of those things. That's really important. As well as I was really struck by for both of you, there's a sense of, what remains after the performance is finished so whether that's explicitly community outreach work and what that looks like or kind of the affects the feelings that remain in you after a performance is finished that they seem really important for both of you about kind of how what remains how you what happens after what the effects of the work are and I think that's really clear both in terms of like in, in both of your like back catalogues of work and in both the work I've seen you do that there's that sense of, of kind of thinking about how yeah how you engage or how audiences might engage in the work after it's finished I wonder if I might and I'm playing the job of, of host so I'm feeling like I'm going to move us on but kind of connect to that is, is to think about what so today we're here particularly talking about artistry and advocacy and I got, I'm being a bit kind of uh academic I guess but I wonder if we might pick up on that second word of advocacy and I might ask the question uh through your performance work through your artistry what are you advocating for and you both touched on that a bit I think already and, and, or, or quite a lot but in other words like what do you hope to achieve through your work like what what are you what are you hoping to get to can I start with Nico yes you have that power um <laughs> I did, I did touch base uh, previously, but for me, because um, I know that growing up, had there been another trans actor when I was like 16 or, or even older, that would have made a massive impact on my life, I think, because I grew up thinking that, that theater is something that definitely does not hold a place for me 
because there was no representation at all anywhere. Um, so that's why uh, just the fact that I am a trans person, I have trans history and I'm still able to, to do my job and I'm able to um, work in, in theater and in, in TV and in voice work. It's like every single job is like a little miracle for me. Um, and I, I believe, or I have to believe, and I, I hope that just the fact that we're existing, that trans people are visible and um, happy and succeeding and, you know, like you said, living our messy, sticky lives, uh, that that already is advocacy on its own, because right now it is, sadly, it's a bit revolutionary to just exist as a trans person and do it um, loudly or visibly. So, so even though I don't necessarily uh, think so in, in every single work that I do, that this is me now advocating for trans people, or, you know, I still, I still think that it happens. Uh, and I'm also tremendously privileged in the sense that it's always up to me whether I um, choose to disclose my trans status. It's not something that can be seen from the outside, but I've made the conscious choice of being out as a trans actor, of talking about it publicly for many reasons. But, but one of them is that I, I just, <laughs> I feel like a lot can be gained from it. And I've already gotten messages from like young trans people saying that because they saw me on stage, they now know that it's a possible career for them as well. Great, thanks Peter. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we're at a moment where, yeah, to, to, to survive and thrive as a trans person in this world is, is absolutely a revolutionary act. And so, yeah, just because you don't bring it to every single role necessarily doesn't mean that the fact your presence there is, is absolutely really important. And those mm -hmm. advocating moments are, are, are there almost whether you like it or not. And I think that's really important in, in thinking through this. Right, but also I think I have to add that, that I still uh, have this power to, to actually uh, create positive representation and to, um, to change how trans people or how gender norms are being depicted on stage or dismantled on stage. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I can sort of actively bring into my work. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 excellent. Thank you, Beth. Yeah, um, I'm just gonna start this one with, I love Miko so much. Um, I'm just so proud and outstanding, like astounded that I know him. Um, sorry, that was me. Um, yeah, I think picking up off what Miko said, being visible is probably one of the um, biggest tools and one of the, I guess, in a way, easiest to utilise for me um, is. Um, so I'm queer and disabled and a woman and I am very visible with that and I talk about that as often as I can because, as Miko said, growing up, that representation for me personally wasn't there so it, it as Miko said it never felt like a place this industry where I could be um, myself um, a place where I could thrive a place where I could learn and also teach others it didn't feel like the industry was ready for that in a way um, so I think being on stage and being myself and I'm very lucky that I've worked with incredible companies and people and groups and charities that have allowed me to learn so much about myself and also my wider community. Because one thing about being visible is that I know my own lived experience, but then when incredible questions come in about the further communities that I am part of, um, I am lucky that I can be in a position where I can reach out to the relevant people or educate myself so that I have these answers. Um, so in that way, I, I, I hope, I hope that I'm a good advocate um, for the communities that I'm part of, but there's always something to learn and there's always someone new with a new thought. And I always say to people when um, people inquire about kind of how to write a disabled character, you know, well, there's, 
not ever going to be one brush stroke that will hit every um nuance every idiosyncrasy every person who is part of this community so um trying to kind of at the moment become a better advocate by doing far more outreach and meeting more people and having these conversations myself because as much as i'm part of these communities i don't have every answer but because i'm visible um i i'm so happy and i'd like i love being someone that people come to but i'm very aware that um i can't speak for everyone but you know the aim is to be able to at least point people in the right direction um so yeah i think that's again be quiet beth thank you applause Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think so much about how to use the platform that we're given, because it's quite rare for, for people in marginalized communities still to be in a position where people come to us with questions or, or come to us offering a platform to say what we want to say or, or to, to talk about the struggles that our communities face. Ah, so good. <laughs> Well, and you know, and it's really kind of, you know, we're talking about, I really like the idea of like holding a place. I think you said, Mika, the idea that you're kind of holding places and, and, and fundamentally when you're on stage, you're kind of holding places in some way for people. You're, you're finding ways to kind of hold positions that other people might identify with. And, uh, and like really representation matters. And it's, it's one of those things that, that, that we kind of come back to again and again. And, and it sort of it almost sounds a bit trite, but I always talk about it with students as like representation matters as in it has material implications. So seeing bodies on stage that look like you or hearing narratives on stage that sound like you tell you you can exist. And I'm really struck by, and there, I, like, there's a really amazing, um, writer called Sarah Ahmed, who, who I am a saying, who I sort of quote all the time, who has this very simple line, which is possibilities have to be recognized as possibilities in order to become possible. And I really like, I think about that so much in terms of representation in that what representation does is make possibilities possible, make lives possible. And I think I see that in work for that people engage with in relation to kind of marginalized communities in particular, it, it's about making possibilities possible and making lives possible. And that's what, that's why these, this sort of work and this sort of thinking and this sort of practice is so important in that sense um i oh yeah go on miko do you want to say something i'm just gonna add that uh, oh absolutely i mean representation can be life saving literally or life destroying and uh and um what was i gonna say oh can't remember i'll remember it soon <laughs> I wonder if I might ask some specific questions that I've got for each of you. And I'll start with um, Beth. And, and again, we're kind of covering stuff that we've like started to touch on, but, but one of the things is that when we're looking back over that, like your, your like work so far, like um, you've performed in, in well-known classics and, and family favorites. We talked about West Side Story and Dick Whittington and those sort of things. But your first show, we think this is correct. It's your first show out of Mount View was Grey Eyes, punk rock musical, right? Reasons to be cheerful. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about working with Grey Eye and how this might have impacted your work since. Thank you for this question. Um, I fucking love Grey Eye. Like, I think if you watch, if you've ever read anything of like an interview, ever watched me, I I love these people with my whole heart. And um. I remember I was sat in, if anyone remembers Mountview Wood Green, I was sat in the um, JM block in one of the like big black box rooms. It was sweaty and great. And it was like the middle of April. And um, a friend of mine messaged me the spotlight link being like, hey, this is you, they're looking for you. And the link was to Grey Eyes, Reasons to be Cheerful. And it was um, Janine West. And it said like, we need a feisty disabled girl who can belt. <laughs> and I was like, oh they are describing me so i you know had no idea what to do i never had an agent so i wrote this poor casting director an essay basically being like these are the reasons you should see me um and i was very lucky and they got back to me and i had the audition and got the job and i kind of i was lucky that i grew up in charities and things like that um so i had met other disabled people um but I didn't know how to be a disabled actor. I didn't know how to be disabled in this environment, in this world. And 
going, you know, the day before rehearsal started, I watched the Paralympic opening ceremony and I watched um, the Grey Eye Lots performance and oh, I'm getting emotional again, damn it. Um, and it was absolutely phenomenal just to see this inclusive group of people. And that's the thing, I used to call it the disabled arts because I thought it was only disabled people who would be in shows like Grey Eye and then turning up on the first day and you've got everyone from every background and we're all viewed in exactly the same way. And that was so um, profound to me um, and getting to play the romantic lead um, who's sexy and feisty and knows her own mind and all of these things which actually I've never seen before. And even in my own life as a disabled woman, people had never seen me in that role. People saw me as a lot of the time victim, a lot of the time uh, inspiration porn, things like that. It was never, you know, this absolute awesome person in my own right. So getting to play this role in a grey eye show that had always been my aim, Jenny Seeley is the love of my life and she knows that. Um, and just kind of, getting to be there was so profound for me to realize that there's a place for me within this industry. And then I guess that kind of done. It also politicized me in a way that I've always been political. I've always been an activist. I've always understood the injustices, especially aimed at my own communities, but I was angry. That was it. And they showed me how to kind of use that anger, but mold it into, um, I guess, actual kind of um, ability to change minds. Because I think anger was shut down conversations as opposed to invite people to open them up because that's what we need. We need to have more conversations. Um, it's not just about the performative aspect of representation. It's not just about bodies on stage. It's about really changing the industry from the ground up and changing what is happening backstage, changing what's happening at the first instances of these ideas so that access and inclusivity is thought of from the off for me. And they taught me that. And I think one of the ways that Grey Eye really helped teach me that was by showing me, um, no one ever said it out loud, but it made me very cognitive, cognizant, help me, <laughs> cognizant of, um, <laughs> I have an MA. <laughs> Um, maybe very cognizant of um, the cycle of discrimination, pretty much. So I guess um, marginalised communities are othered a lot of the time. And that othering um, leads to kind of vilification or animosity. And then that animosity leads to the threat of violence and death and ugh, all of these disgusting things that are very prevalent still. And then because of that threat, the marginalised communities tend to, you know, uh, diminish themselves and everything that they can achieve for safety. Um, so they will go um, into themselves. They'll not be as visible as they could be. They won't talk about the beautiful nuance that we all have within us and actually what it is to be us. Um, and then because of that, um, we are seen as more of a minority group. And then because of that, we're kind of seen as, you know, there's so little of them. Why, why do they need such a massive amount of representation, which then leads to not being seen in the public eye which leads to the vilification and othering and it's just this cyclical thing that needs to be broken and having that shown to me um in quite an explicit way you know from being in a show where that didn't happen um made me realize that that's so prevalent and needs to be broken down and i think that's one of the best things gray i gave to me that confidence to realize that by being I guess, outspoken as I always have been, but being able to use my words in, um, and use my experiences and be as visible as possible um, means that we might be able to break down um, this, you know, tale as old as time, but very archaic, very, um, for me, done structure. We just need it to go. and. I think that's one of the best things Grey I gave to me. I'm going to be quiet. I know this has been long. I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> no, please never apologise for speaking, honestly. Like, and I think also it's so great to hear, like, because what that's about structures, right? It's about that actually we 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 combat structures, not we don't think about um 
or one should not think about access as a thing we add on at the end or halfway through, but rather access as a thing which is the starting point from which work is made. And, and you start there, that changes how you make work. And I was also really struck by the idea that also you think about how we, if you, if you think about that from the beginning, that doesn't only improve access for or representation of disabled identities. It might improve for how you're able to represent women, for example, it might, you know, so it's not just, it's not limited to when we think intersectionally about these things, improving how we represent disabled bodies and identities and lives on stage also improves yeah. how we represent the wide variety of identities that we might have it. And that's the exciting thing to hear about. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's something so magical about having these genuinely authentic voices um because there is no one person is the same and that's why we do what we do we're storytellers we want to know more about human nature about the human condition so by inviting these voices that we might not necessarily have had within our industry within rooms that we work in before the art we make is going to be richer and through that it's going to be better we're going to attract bigger wider more diverse to use a buzzword I personally hate, but it's true, um, audiences. And I, I just think there's, there is no downside, <laughs> there really <laughs> isn't, which is why it's just, um, as soon as that kind of, you know, as I termed it, cycle of discrimination, um, as soon as I clocked on to that, I realized that the way to kind of break it down is to just have the authenticity there and not in a, um, I guess, as I said, performative way, not just in a, you know, I'm aware that as a disabled, physically disabled performer on stage, I'm aware of the optics of that, but it would be amazing to have many other people, you know, behind casting panels, um, stage management, to have them in the lighting teams, just kind of, yeah. I'm just so happy you got to start your career after Mount View with Grey Eye and Reasons to be Cheerful. It was such a fantastic show. I, I saw them at the end of their tour in London. And if it's not clear, we are best friends. And I just could not adore Beth Hintley or more. And I'm fully ready for you to have a TED Talk. And <laughs> never, never stop talking. Please never stop talking. <laughs> Great. All right. I might move on and ask Miko a question, if that's all right, which is I wanted to think about some of the work you did da back in in the MA at Mount View and kind of cast your mind back to that. However, many, many years ago, it feels like that was now. And one of the things that I talked about at the beginning was the creative project unit that we work on, which is which is where you make a kind of performance or a presentation that's grounded in research around a particular topic and on um, full disclosure so I was I was Miko's tutor for that project back back then and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about that process and maybe how creating your own work um, has influenced how you engage now in rehearsal processes or has changed how you think about yourself as a performer. Uh, well first of all having you as my tutor was incredible um <laughs> i just remember the, the feeling of of being in the room with you for some of the first times and and like um sort of cautiously talking about what i'm interested in and how i'd like to um i would like to make my project about trans representation and sort of bring myself and my identity into it and i think that was like one of the first the first time in my life that i was able to talk about uh trans things in theater and have the person sitting next to me absolutely understand what I'm talking about and bring their own expertise into it and make it feel like a completely safe situation. You know, I didn't have to explain anything to you or, or um, like there wasn't a fearful second in that room. And it's just incredible to have someone who also brings their complete, incredible academic and artistic knowledge into the room. So I'm just so grateful to Mount View and to you that you were there. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, and looking back, I think making my MA project actually was like a little revolution <laughs> for myself in my own path. Um, and it taught me so much about the power of my voice and the power of our authentic stories. Um, and, and it made me discover a lot of um, 
the strength and the courage that that comes with using your own history in your art. Uh, and I think that's because it was such a great experience and it taught me so much. Then when I returned back to Finland uh, after after my MA and after working in London for some months, I I then had the courage to to sort of bring that work here as well. I entered a competition centering sort of solo shows with um, using Finnish poetry as material. And I made it 100% about transness and queerness <laughs> using like a hundred year old poems uh, that to me spoke about trans history or, or you know, the, the feelings that, that come with being trans or being queer. Uh, and obviously that was not the case a hundred years ago, those, those poems are actually about something completely different, but uh, I won the fucking thing. And and got such amazing feedback, and and one of the prizes was getting to do this full hour long solo show for the next year's festival. So then I was able to actually get some money and get a full team going on, and uh, create a monologue. And uh, so that one was then like a fully autobiographical thing, <laughs> where I had a director and a dramaturg, and and we worked together on the show that then I feel brought me not only like a, lots of success and, and money, <laughs> but it, I used it as this, um, what's the word? I've been surrounded by only the Finnish language for 15 months, <laughs> but as a tool, let's say the word tool again, as a tool to come out publicly, because I always thought that I, I want to be publicly out as a trans person. I, I want that to be uh, a known part of who I am, but I would love to do it through my work um, instead of coming out uh, in the press. I would love for a chance to harness that in my creative work and then naturally talk about it. Uh, and honestly, everything just went perfectly in regards to that. And, and I feel that it's, it's my trans history right now is only a, a positive force in my life and in my career. Um, it's only bringing great things into my life and into my work. And, and it's such a force that I can sort of use whenever. Uh, and definitely what I did at Mount View and what, what you helped me with plays a massive part in all that. Thank you, Mika. That's really nice to hear and really nice to, you know, one of the things I think that we think, I think about again and again as a teacher, but I, it is about being, being in the room and, be, and bringing ourselves into the room. And I think that that's something that, bringing myself into it, that, and that's something that, that I really encourage students to do and other teachers to do and that that is kind of really valuable and I feel like that's sort of come up again and again today this idea of how the different ways that we are in the room whether we like it or not whether the people who are in the room like it or not with us that that we kind of are present in in a way and I think that that that, that the, those different holdings of space those different presences in the room those different are, are absolutely to return to the start about heart as well right absolutely about about bringing our heart into the room and, bring, and all of those things of where we started with Beth that that feels really important about how we bring our heart into the room and I think that that's really exciting and innovating and, and meaningful for sure. Yeah, it's, it's so powerful when people are allowed to be authentically who they are and they have the space and the safety to do so the the amount of power that they oh it's it's just it's it's incredible and now I remember what I was <laughs> meant to say before uh, regarding representation it's just the thought that uh, theater doesn't only reflect reality it actively creates it and changes it that's that's that <laughs> I'm feeling that verbatim that's phenomenal <laughs> Excellent. All right. I think we have to start rounding up because um, we've probably gone a bit over time. But I want to ask you very quickly um, if you 
could think back to who you were before you started Mount View, just before you were starting the MA at Mount View, if you could send a message back to yourself then, uh, what advice or what what sentence or what even just one word would you give to, would you like to send back to yourself to think about who if you're about to embark on that journey again? Rico? Um, I'm, I'm just really thrilled that I ended up going to Mount View when I did, uh, cause it was life changing. Uh, oh, and this is so wanky, but <laughs> I just, uh, cause I remember when I first met, uh, everyone at Mount View and, and there was this tiny, northerner <laughs> who sat beside me and just used more swear words than I've heard within five minutes in my entire life. Uh, <laughs> Beth Hinton Lemur. And I'm just, I think, despite everything that Mount has done for me professionally and um, uh, in my life in general, just meeting Beth, honestly, was the best fucking thing. <laughs> Tears. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it was really, like I was literally because we be like, um, I tell myself, oh, what have you done to me? Twat, me cry. Um, <laughs> apologies. Um, I think I would tell myself like, don't worry, you'll find your people. Like, well, person. <laughs> but like, yeah, there's, there's, um, I think the whole imposter syndrome was huge for me, especially because I didn't it's not you know I think a lot of the narrative around going to drama school is I've wanted this since I was born and for me I was a very happy little archaeologist but um I think so the imposter syndrome was huge but if I could tell myself you know you'll find your people you'll find your place and you'll find your voice I would have been happy as Larry which is a phrase I taught Miko earlier today <laughs> Excellent. All right. Uh, tell you what, one last bit and then we'll say bye, which is um, which is maybe a big one, but see, we'll get to you. Like, and we've maybe covered some of it, but what do you think the future of theatre or musical theatre is? Where do you think the future of it is or where do you want the future of it to be? Beth? Um, I want it to be, I guess, one, as like just a general thought, less centralised. I think we all forget our own power within this. We forget that we have the artistry, we have the creativity and we have the heart to create our own work and to be the voice that we're seeking. And um, I, I hope that that's the future. I hope that more people take the power into their own hands and kind of not only decentralize what we know of as theater, but realize that we can be that voice for ourselves and when we are that voice and we are so strong with it those other people our people as i call them will come to you and more people will hear that and then that will incentivize and um galvanize more people to use their voices and i think that's where i want the future to go i want it to be full of beauty and idiosyncrasy and kind of honesty and I think the way that that will happen is with more people finding their own voice and seeing themselves in more theatre. So I think that's what I see. And also I think Miko's probably gonna win a Tony. Thank you, Miko. I can't, um, yes, inclusivity a multitude of stories, uh, authenticity. I want stories of joy from marginalized communities. I want it so bad. I'm so sick of, of victimhood. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I, oh, I am. And I hope that in five years, even in the UK, we will laugh about how they used to cast cis men playing trans women. We will laugh about it and it'll be embarrassing but it will never happen again. Um, but I feel that uh, 
the industry in Finland and the industry in the UK are just so completely different. Um, I have yet to see a disabled or a trans actor on a musical theater production or in any sort of commercial theater production ever. So I feel like there's just so much work to do. Um, but the industry is changing. People, people are hungry for uh, representation and for these stories and for these people and for, for everyone to get a chance to, to just be there, <laughs> be in the fucking room. Uh, so it's not as if it, it wouldn't sell, you know. I, I, there's so much proof that it will sell and it will change um, the world for the better. The change just needs to be quicker and we need to get there quicker. Great, all right. Thank you both. Um, we're gonna wrap up there, but I just really wanted to thank you for coming and chatting to us today. Uh, and really to thank you for kind of bringing yourselves into the Zoom room, for talking about the like, I don't know, for talking about the revolutions that you're engaged in both big and little and personal and, and, and structural. And I think to kind of go back to the start to, for bringing your hearts into the space as well, because I think that's really important. And I think I'm really glad that we've been able to kind of be in a space together um, and talk about these things. Um, that's everything. And um, I think we should say bye, but thank you so much, Beth and Miko, and I'm sure I'll see you all soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye.